Okay, part four for cosmetology hair coloring. Um, okay, so we're going to talk now about the release statement. Um, this is optional. Um, I think it's a good idea, but um, some people are not comfortable with it. But what a release form is, um, well, if, okay, first of all, in cosmetology school, it's mandatory. So if you're in cosmetology school, you do need to do this. But if you are just uh, working in the salon, um, you don't have to. So a release statement is used by schools and many other salons when providing a chemical service. Um, its purpose is to explain to clients that there is a risk involved in any chemical service and that if the client's hair is in questionable condition, it may not uh, withstand the request chemical treatment. Um, basically, what it is, is it's designed to protect the school or salon or, or yourself um, from responsibility for accidents or damages. So to formulate hair color, so there are five basic questions. What is the natural level and does it include gray hair? What is the level and tone of the previously colored hair? What is the client's desired level and tone? Are contributing pigments or undertones to be revealed? What colors should be mixed to get the desired result? So all of this goes into um, making the formulation of your of your um your color so deposit and lifting ability so the combination of the shade selected and the volume of hydrogen peroxide determines the deposit and lifting ability of a hair color okay um so just remember that that it's a combination of the color that you want to use so the shade the shade selected the color and the volume of hydrogen peroxide. So is it gonna be deposit only? Is it going to do neither, which would be 20 volume, or is it gonna lift a little, 30 volume? Is it gonna lift more, 40 volume? Is it gonna lift a lot, a lot, lot, 50 volume? Don't go above that. <laughs> Always remember to formulate with both lift and deposit in mind um to order sorry um in order to achieve the proper balance for the desired end result a higher lifting formula however may not have enough deposit to cancel the warmth of a client's natural color contributing pigment the volume of hydrogen peroxide mixed with the hair color product will also influence the lift and deposit so um what that's saying is if it's like a a formula that's going to lift um it might turn the hair a little oranger so make sure that if that's going to happen that you're going to be um using a complementary color to avoid um the orange tones if that's not what they're going for so mixing permanent hair colors what do you use there's applicator bottles and there's brush and bowl so applicator bottles, um, the bottle must be large enough for the color and developer, and you're going to mix according to the manufacturer's directions. So this is um, usually better for liquid hair color, not cream. Um, so like uh, toners, I always use an applicator bottle. And then there are some hair colors that are more liquid. Um, they usually come in a bottle rather than in a tube. Um, brush and bowl are... Um, you're going to use a non-metallic bowl. So you're going to use either plastic or glass because if there is like a metal bowl would be bad because the metal that's in the bowl itself can interfere with the color and cause weird chemical reactions. So don't use a metal bowl. Use plastic or glass. Usually people use um, plastic. And this is going to be for um, color that comes out of a tube. So it's like the creamier color, which is a little bit too thick for applicator bottle. Um, with the brush and bowl, pour the developer first, then the product. Because if you put the product in first and then you pour the developer, the developer is more liquid and it's going to splash. Um, and make sure that you blend thoroughly. So the patch test, um, we talked about the patch test earlier. Um, I'm not going to, I'll go over this quickly, but we already talked about it. So this is to identify an allergy. Um, the color that you're going to use on them, you're going to put it behind the neck, a negative behind the ear. A negative skin test will show no sign of inflammation, indicates the color is safe. A positive result will show redness and a slight rash or welt. 
and you don't want to use the color on them. So applying hair color. To ensure successful results when performing a hair coloring service, the colorist must follow a prescribed procedure and never leave the client unattended while the color is processing. And the reason for that is because something could start happening to the client. They might start getting an itch or a burn and you want to be there or it could even drip down a little and, you know, it might get into their eye. Emergencies can happen and accidents can happen. A client could itch their their head because, you know, the color is kind of bothering them and then they could rub their eye. Now they've got color in their eye. And if you're out to lunch while your color, your client is just sitting there alone, then you've got a big problem on your hands. So you don't want to leave the client unattended. You don't have to sit there and stare at them the whole time, but be nearby. And then a preliminary strand test. So what this is, is like the picture shows, <clears throat> it determines how the hair will react to the color formula and how long the formula should be left on the hair. The strand test is performed after the client is prepared for the coloring service. So this is really nice if you're worried that the color is going to be the wrong color or it's going to damage the hair too much. You can just, or, or you want to know how long to leave it on or, or you know, how long it, it's going to take to lift to the desired result. This is nice. You could just do this in an area that's inconspicuous and let this um, start working, you know, while you're mixing the color and keeping an eye on it. And then you could check it maybe when you're halfway through and see how long it took. Um, but it, it's just a state, it's a safety net. So temporary colors. There are many methods of applying a temporary color, depending on the product used. You may apply colored gels, mousses, foams, or sprays at your workstation after your client has been shampooed. Always use and apply these color products according to the manufacturer's directions. So temporary colors are just kind of like sprays that have color in them. Um, they're, you know, they're not really um, a, a true like color color. Semi-permanent hair colors, um, uh, they deposit only um, and they do not lighten. Remember that color is applied on top of existing color. It always creates a deeper color and alters the tone. So you can even just put a semi-color, semi-permanent color over another hair color just to enhance it. The porosity of the hair will determine how well these products saturate the hair. Um, traditional semi-permanent colors can build up on the hair ends with repeated applications. So if you keep using semi-permanents, a lot, they can become more like a demi-permanent and be harder to um, get out of the hair if you're using them often. So demi-permanent hair, demi hair color is a little bit stronger than semi-permanent. This application is similar to semi-permanent color, just a little stronger. Follow the manufacturer's gui guidelines for application and processing time for the product you have selected. Um, gray hair presents special challenges when formulated demi-permanent color because demi-permanent isn't going to cover gray all the way. It's just going to blend. Hair that previously received a color service will have a greater degree of porosity, so it'll suck up the color more. So single process hair color can be virgin application. It can be a retouch application. It can be a single process color retouch. Okay, so virgin application just means um, hair that has never ever been colored before um retouch application and by the way virgin application it doesn't have to be the first time in their life that they've ever colored their hair but it can be the hair has been colored before um 10 years ago and since then the hair has obviously been all cut off and the hair that's grown in again is now virgin hair it's never been colored okay um, the retouch application is commonly known as like roots, like touching up the roots. Um, a single process color retouch can, you know, this is just touching up the roots with, you don't have to pre-lighten it, you don't have to fill it, you don't have to tone it. It's just a single process color retouch. So applying color to new growth and faded ends. Overlapping can cause breakage and a line of demarcation. Um, which is the visible line separating the hair color from the new growth. Um, so you don't want to overlap um, because especially if you're using um, bleach or a hair lightener or color with a higher volume of um, 
processing solution or peroxide, um, it can cause breakage. So if the hair has already been pre-lightened, don't overlap. Just go right to the, the, the new growth, but not through it. Um, process hair color according to your analysis and strand test results. Bringing permanent hair color through the ends to refresh, refresh faded color can cause unnecessarily damage to the hair. So what people do sometimes if, um, if the client's hair has faded, let's say they have, gray, they have gray roots, but the color that you did last time has faded on the hair that um, is not gray that you've colored previously. So what a lot of people do is they'll put the fresh color that you used last time, but just on the gray roots, and then you'll just use a semi-permanent um, through the ends or even a toner just to brighten up the hair that's faded. But you don't want to put permanent hair color over hair that's already been permanently colored because that's just unnecessary damage. So just put permanent color on the roots um, and then put a semi-permanent on the ends that are faded. So double processed hair color. So hair lightening, bleaching, or decolorizing. Um, the double process, high lift coloring, it's two-step blonding, and then pre-lightening is applied at the same time as the hair lightening. So for double process, first you're going to lighten, and then you're going to put the either toner or color over it. So how to use um, lighteners. So there's three forms of lighteners. There's oil, which is an on-the-scalp lightener. There's cream, which is also on-the-scalp lightener. Or there's powder, which is off the scalp lightener. And um, I'm going to tell you, when they say lightener, it's it's um, they're talking about bleach. So in front of a client, it's better to use the word lightener than bleach because the word bleach always scares clients, almost always. Um, so when you're talking about bleach, it's best and it's definitely more professional um, to use the word lightener. So that's what the book is doing here. Um, so there's oil bleach. You can put that on the scalp. It's very gentle. I love it. There's cream bleach. It's also pretty gentle. Um, it's almost as gentle as the oil. And you can put that on the scalp. And then the powder bleach, um, you don't want to put that on the scalp. It's off the scalp. So you would put that in foils or um, the ends of the hair. But you can put it anywhere, just not on the scalp. Um, because it's too harsh and it will it can burn the skin. It, and it's very painful. So on the scalp lighteners or on the scalp bleach, oil and cream are the most popular and they're the mildest, but they're only appropriate for one or two levels of lift. Powdered or off the scalp bleach or lightener is called quick lightener or quick bleach. Um, you don't apply it to the scalp. It's strong enough for blonding. It'll lift many levels. Um, obviously too, um, the higher level of peroxide that you put in with it, the higher the lift is going to be, the more lifting it's going to do, the more levels it will lift. So if you're doing 40 volume developer with, with a powdered bleach, look out, it's going to work fast and it's going to be strong and it will lift a lot of um, levels. If you're doing a bleach with 10 volume, it's going to be gentle, it's going to take longer and it's not going to lift as much. Um, so they, so powdered off the scalp lightener or bleach contains oxygen releasing boosters. Um, it dries out more quickly than other lighteners and, um, it expands and spreads out during the processing. So if you're doing a balayage and you're using powdered bleach, um, if you're not using foils, if you're just doing free-handed techniques, um, use a way higher developer. That's when I would say go for the 50 because as soon as it dries out from the air, um, it stops working. So um, you want it to be a little stronger. But if you're doing a highlight with foil, you don't need to use um, a higher volume because it's not gonna um, dry. So time factors, darker hair has more melanin. It takes longer to lighten. So if the darker the hair is, the more time it needs to be left on if you're trying to lighten it. Um, porosity influences timing. Tone influences timing. <coughs> Strength of product influences timing. Heat leads to quicker lightening. So if you see um, 
people putting their highlights or, you know, anything under the dryer, it's because they want it to work faster. So that's why they're under the hair dryer. So the preliminary strand test, watch the strand carefully for its reaction to the lightening mixture, especially noting any discoloration or breakage. Reconditioning may be required prior to toning. Um, if the test shows that the hair is not light enough, increase the strength of the mixture and or increase the processing time. Um, if the hair strand is too light, decrease the strength of the mixture and or decrease the processing time. So lightener retouch or bleach retouch. Um, lighten new growth first. Process, or I'm sorry, proceed as for virgin lightener, except apply um, a product to new growth only. A cream lightener is generally used for a lightener retouch. Overlapping can cause severe breakage and lines of demarcation. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to use toners. So you need to know about the contributing pigment. You need to read the manufacturer literature and you need to pay attention to what color the underlightened hair is. I'm not going to um, go into it any further because I talked a lot about toners earlier, how to use them when I was talking about the shades. So um, refer to that. Um, this is what we were talking about too. Toner application, so your speed and accuracy are both important factors and the application will determine to a large extent whether you get a good color result. Um, the procedure for applying um, low or non-peroxide toners may vary. Check with your instructor for directions. Special effects hair coloring, some co um, color some strands lighter than natural color. Um, it adds variety of lightener shades and illusion of depth does not contrast strongly with natural color. Light colors cause the light to advance toward the eye, to appear larger and to make details more visible. So special effects, um, basically what that means is it's highlighting, it's balayage, um, it's ombre. Um, those are examples of special effects. So reverse highlighting is referred to as low lighting. So this is where instead of, um, weaving out strands and putting bleach on it, you're weaving out strands and putting dark color in it. It could be any color. Some strands color darker than natural, receding smaller appearance of dark areas. Then we have the cap technique. Um, it's not that common anymore, um, but sometimes if the hair is too short, like you've seen that middle picture, it's way too short for highlights and foils. So in times like that, you would have to use a cap. Um, so you pull little strands of hair through a perforated cap with a thin um, plastic or metal hook. Um, the number of strands pulled through the cap determines the degree of highlighting achieved. So you pull it through the holes, you apply your bleach on it, and then you put a cap on it, and it gives the, the same highlighted look. Foil technique involves coloring selected strands by slicing or weaving out sections, placing them on foil or plastic wrap, applying lightener or permanent hair color, and sealing them in the wrap. And I will show you how to do that in person. Slicing. So slicing is instead of weaving strands through, you're just getting a whole slice um, of hair. It involves making a straight part at the scalp, and positioning a narrow 1 8 inch section of hair over foil and applying lightener or color. And again, I'm gonna show you that in person. Weaving, um, this is what I was talking about. It involves selected strands that are picked up using a zigzagging motion of the comb. So you can see the difference between the slicing and the weaving. Slicing, weaving. Balayage technique. So balayage, there's many different ways of doing it, but it involves um, painting product onto a clean styled hair, also known as the freeform technique. And again, this is something that I have to show you how to do in person, but you are more freehanded. Um, most people don't use foils, some do. Um, and yeah, so it's freeform. So toning highlighted and dimensionally colored hair. You're gonna decolorize the hair to the um, desired level. Um, so this is how you tone highlighted 
and dimensionally colored. So you're going to decolorize or bleach to the desired level. Consider the porosity and pigmentation differences from strand to strand. Um, you are going to avoid affecting the untreated hair. You're going to use non-oxidative toner, use traditional semi-permanent color, or use a no-lift deposit only demi-permanent color that will not cause additional lightening. And to get more about this, it is on page 700. And we're going to stop here.